Good evening. And thank you for your interest and everybody for coming Saturday night on a college campus and you're listening to a lecture. My gosh, um, that's impressive. So uh, when you think of John Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, uh, Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan, each in his own way is firmly set in a certain period of American history. Yet as vibrant as they were at the peak of their power and their influence, none of these men would easily slip into the contemporary political world. Their leadership was unique to their time and to their place. That conclusion does not ring true for Robert F. Kennedy. His appearance is ever modern, the shaggy hair, the skinny ties, the suit jacket off, the shirt sleeves rolled. Beyond appearances, what is striking about RFK are the themes he returned to again and again, themes that still energize the debate and resonate in our own time and place. Think of the headlines over the last few years. And it is easy to hear Robert Kennedy's voice and imagine him speaking out as he did 50 years ago on the madness of gun violence, the shame of police brutality, the need for compassion in welcoming immigrants and refugees, the urgent need to defy the call to war, and to where war has broken out, seek peace. The focus not only on stopping terrorism, but of an understanding and addressing its root causes, the destructive force of hate, the disillusionment of young people, the dis um, the injustice of a criminal justice system which discriminates based on race and class, where thousands go to jail simply because they are too poor to make bail, a system which gives massive tax breaks to the wealthiest in society, who also happen to be the largest political <coughs> contributors, and then forces municipalities to make up for the lost revenue by targeting poor people for petty crimes and forcing them into increasing debt, all part of the new Jim Crow. And the duty to address the struggles of those who are not in the headlines, the most vulnerable among us, the farm workers, the small farmers, the workers who long since saw factories and jobs that supported them replaced by cheap labor or more recently technology. Native Americans, those suffering in the hollers of Appalachia, Appalachia and the Mississippi Delta and the most destitute slums of our great cities. Bobby Kennedy's presence was grounded not only in policy, but most especially in values. Values that never wavered, values that stand in high contrast with too much of our political leadership today. Integrity, courage, faith, humanism, patriotism, toughness, ambition all tempered by curiosity, children and dogs, laughter, fun, and most especially, love. Jeff Greenfield, RFK speechwriter, and Frank Mankiewicz, RFK press secretary, posited that much of my father's credo was, get your boot off his neck. Indeed, Daddy stood up to bullies throughout his life. As a grade school student, he disdained gossip and meanness. As a college student, he refused to play away games unless the African-American student on the Harvard football team was allowed to stay in the same hotel as the rest of the squad. Eventually, the entire football team came round to his position. He bravely took on Father Feeney, the anti-Semitic chaplain at Harvard, who spewed hate for insisting there is no salvation outside the church. Feeney was later excommunicated. He traveled to Israel in 1948 and advocated for US support for the new and beleaguered nation, surrounded by enemies. As a law student, he invited Ralph Bunch the first African-American to win the Nobel Peace Prize to speak at segregated University of Virginia, and then successfully petitioned the UVA Law School to allow Bunch to speak before a mixed race crowd. Unable to find a hotel in the area which would take Bunch, Daddy and Mommy invited Ambassador Bunch to stay in their tiny home, where they endured a night of white supremacists hurling racial epithets and throwing Molotov Molotov cocktails at their house. 
In the 1950s, he worked for the Senate Committee on Investigations for five months, during which he focused on how U.S. allies were benefiting financially by selling goods to China, which in turn were using those goods to create the machinery of war and use it against U.S. soldiers in Korea. His report was lauded as exemplary and as the only usable intelligence to come out of the committee chaired by Joe McCarthy. Daddy spent the entirety of his time fighting the excesses of McCarthy and Roy Cohn and likened McCarthy's insatiable need for publicity as though he was on a wild toboggan ride, so high on and addicted to the, ad the adrenaline of the press that McCarthy was unaware and uncaring about the tree at the end of the hill. Daddy then joined the majority committee and exposed the excesses which caused Cohn's resignation and led to the end of McCarthy's reign of terror. Asked a decade later by Peter Moss how he could have worked for Senator McCarthy, Daddy responded, well, at the time, I thought there was a serious internal security threat to the United States, and Joe McCarthy seemed to be the only one doing anything about it. I was wrong. That I was wrong. You don't hear that from a lot of politicians. He joined the Rackets Committee and pursued union bosses like Jimmy Hoffa, who were stealing from the rank and file. As Attorney General, he stood up to Bull Connor, Governor Patterson, Governor Wallace, and other white supremacists on behalf of civil rights activists. When St. Edward County, Virginia, sought to avoid desegregation by closing all its public schools, Robert Kennedy opened the St. Edward County Free Schools imported volunteer teachers from across the, county, the country and made sure that black kids would receive an excellent education while the case wended its way through the courts. At Justice, he obtained legislation to reform juvenile justice where he saw children, mostly of color, the victims of a cruel system which pushed them to crime. His focus on poverty and his establishment at the Department of Justice of the Juvenile Delinquency Committee led to the establishment of VISTA, legal aid, mental health centers, youth development projects, neighborhood services, and the foundation of what would become the War on Poverty. He ordered the Justice Department for the first time in its history to resolve Indian land claims rather than fighting them. As Senator, his legislation assured Puerto Ricans the right to vote in New York. He came to the aid of farm workers in California, miners in West Virginia, African Americans in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and Native Americans in New York State and across the West. But to leave it at stopping the bullies would not do justice to Robert Kennedy. On that terrible night, when he told a crowd in downtown Indianapolis that their leader, Martin Luther King, had been murdered, he included in his remarks a quote from Aeschylus. He said, we must strive to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of the world. Indeed, Daddy focused much of his life taming the savageness and prosecuting the bullies, but he also made gentle the life of the world. Viewing the photographs from Daddy's 1968 presidential bid 50 years ago brings back a flood of memories, images of people reaching out to him, almost desperate to touch him. They also remind me of the aftermath of Daddy returning home, his fingers red and swollen, his cufflinks missing. Sometimes they would take his belt. One time they even took his shoes. How do you do that in the middle of shaking people's hands? I don't know, but it happened. And since then, I've heard literally thousands and thousands of stories from people in my own country and all around the world saying what Robert Kennedy meant to them. Each story is different, but there's one common denominator that made my father so special. He reached deeply into the hearts of his audience, and what he touched was the noble soul in each of us. He he made us want to be our best selves. And that was what was so extraordinary about him. Robert Kennedy was a presidential candidate, a senator, the attorney general, his brother's confidant, campaign manager, a prosecutor, a lawyer, a husband, a son, a brother, and an uncle. 
But his most important role, as far as I was concerned, was that of father to his brood of what would become 11 children, seven boys and four girls spanning 16 years. So um, most of what I've said you can probably read in books, um, and I hope a few of you have. But I thought I'd just take a few minutes and tell you a few personal stories. Is that good? Yeah, okay. Um, that was the right answer. So, <laughs> so um, my parents really didn't separate their home life from, their, uh, from my father's professional life. So when I was growing up, my earliest memories are when my father was attorney general at the height of the civil rights movement. And there were always civil rights activists and um, social justice activists at our home. And we also went to my father's office quite a bit. And my mother would um, uh, on typically uh, pile six or seven kids into the back of her convertible with two or three dogs and always a football and bring us down to the Justice Department to visit my dad. And we would run, he had a huge, huge, huge um, office. It was, I would say, it, it was about two thirds of the size of this room. I mean, it was big. It was big enough so that you could throw a football across it. And um, that's why he loved that office. Uh, and um, that's why he, he, he used that particular office. But anyway, so we would go and we'd run around his office a little bit and then we'd go down to the bottom of the Justice Department and there was a hallway, a secret tunnel that you could walk to the FBI building in. And we would go over to the FBI building and watch the sharpshooters at practice and we loved to do that. And at the time, the head of the FBI, who knows who the head of the FBI was then? Anybody? Yep, that's right, J. Edgar Hoover was J. Edgar Hoover. So J. Edgar Hoover was um, not known for his sense of humor or his love of children. <laughs> <laughs> and he said at the time that the two biggest threats to American democracy are Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy, and my father was his boss. So um, anyway, so we were, one day we were watching the sharpshooters and there was, and this is the weird part of the story, there was a suggestion box in the bottom of the FBI building so you could put in a suggestion about what they could be doing better. And um, so my mother, you know, she saw that and she took out her little telltale red pen and she made a suggestion. She put that in the box. And um, then a very astute FBI agent went and took it out of the box and then ran it up to J. Edgar Hoover who immediately had it sent to daddy's office. So by the time mommy got the, all the kids and the dogs and the football and brought us back to daddy's office, he was reading mommy's suggestion, which was get a new director. <laughs> so um, this, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this was an, a very early sort of lesson in the importance of speaking truth to power. Um, when we were kids, we, you know, we, we, I had seven brothers. There were a lot of battles in our house. It was, it was sort of constant. And so, um, uh, but I remember this one battle in particular. My brother Michael is, was 18 years older than me. And um, so we were always together, and we had a magnolia tree, and a magnolia tree is, do you, are you guys familiar with magnolia trees? Okay, so they're the best climbing trees on earth. They're amazing. And so we had this great magnolia tree, and we had not one but two tree houses in it, and we were playing a game which we often played in which um, it was World War II. And Michael, because he was stronger and better aim, was always the Americans. And I was always the doomed Germans. Uh, and <laughs> so he was <laughs> up in the top tree house of magnolia tree, and he was taking magnolia pods that um, look exactly like grenades, but uh, feel like rocks when they hit you in the head. And I was supposed to go take over the fort, and he was throwing, you know, rocks at me. And so uh, one too many hit my head and I scrambled out of the tree and I ran up to my father's office, which the door was always open, but if it was closed, you really could not go in there, really. 
that idea. So um, I, the door was closed. I opened the door, went running up to him, my you know, tears streaming down my face, my little white satin bow askew. And I told him the whole horrible story. And uh, he, you know, took me into his arms and he kissed me and he dried my tears and he said, you go get Michael and bring him here right now. And I was like, great. <laughs> Justice will be done. This is the Attorney General. Yay. Okay, so um, I go and get my brother and he comes in and, uh, and my father says, okay, Michael, you tell me what happened and Carrie, you're not allowed to interrupt. And then, Carrie, you tell me what happened. Michael's not allowed to hit truck. So I don't remember all the details of that story, but um, I remember it was really hard not to interrupt. And it was really, it was very irritating. And then he made us, but you know, it, 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 in the end, I realized that I wasn't all right, and Michael wasn't all wrong. And uh, then he made us kiss and make up and go to our rooms and read for an hour. And <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I think the lesson that he had for us that day was the lesson that he had for our country, which is, um, which is we all have to take responsibility for our actions. And we, we have to look carefully at them, be reflective, look at them seriously. What's our, what's our role? Um, in, in our problems, and that peace is not something just to pray for, that we all have a responsibility for creating peace and, and creating forgiveness and, and not viewing our brothers as our enemy, but viewing them as our brothers. And, um, and then we should read, which is why it's good you're all here, because reading is important, understanding, gaining knowledge getting a, a better sense of what's going on in the world. Um, then the, the last story I thought I'd tell you is, uh, is one other time when he and my mother were going a tri on a trip around the world. And they, when we, Daddy always read poetry to us. And every Sunday night, we all had to memorize a poem and say it out loud at the dinner table. So. Um, he uh, took out the poetry book that was always next to our dining room table, and he read The Charge of the Light Brigade. So are you guys familiar with that poem? Okay, so for those of you who aren't, this is the story of a terrible, bloody battle in which um, uh, men, 400 men, I'm trying to think, it's 400, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 400. Yeah, 400 men charge into battle and they know that they're surrounded by the enemy. And so they know they're all gonna be slaughtered, but they're the, the, the head, their captain or whatever it is, is telling them they have to do it. And so they're gonna follow him. And, um, you know, why would you ask your cute little five-year-old daughter with the blonde hair and the, white bow to memorize that particular horrible bloody poem. And I, I think there are a couple reasons. And I think, number one, Daddy loved literature, and he wanted us to love literature and uh, appreciate poetry. But um, there's, there's, I can't remember the whole poem now, but I remember a couple of lines, which theirs was not to reason why, theirs is but to do and die into the valley of death rode the 600. There were 600, not 400, <laughs> <laughs> incidentally. Um, but <laughs> so it was at the time of the Vietnam War. And he was saying, you gotta, you've got to ask questions. You can't just follow authority. You have to question authority. And that was very, very, very important to him. You've got to make your own way. You've got to make your own mind up. Don't just take other people's opinions. Even people you respect, even people you're supposed to follow, even people whose society is telling you this is the person you go into battle with, you gotta ask. Um, so I think all of those are really important lessons for today, for our world today, as we look around. And um, 
I, uh, I, I want to end with showing you a video because this, this is really amazing. So this, let me just set this up. This was after Martin Luther King died, uh, Daddy spoke to a crowd that was organized in downtown Indianapolis. And it was an African-American part of the city. It was in the ghetto. And um, the police refused to give him an escort. They said, it's too dangerous. And the mayor of Indianapolis said, you cannot go. And um, he said, well, they're here for me, and I'm, I'm going to go. And he went, and he explained to the crowd that their hero had just been killed. And he did it with such compassion and such beauty that Indianapolis was the only real big city in America that did not burn that night. But over 100 cities across our country burned that night. Indianapolis did not. The next day, and that's a very famous speech, and I really urge you, it's only like two or three minutes long. Go and look at it at YouTube. After tonight, if you're interested, go and, go and look at it, it's great. But I didn't want to show you that, because a lot of people have seen that speech. I wanted to show you the speech he gave the following day. He went, he canceled all of his, um, his uh, political events, but the African American community urged him to go and speak at the Cleveland City Club. And he talked about the mindless menace of violence. And I want to show you this film because I think, to me, it demonstrates not only an issue that we're facing in our own country and around the world today, but also how extraordinary, extraordinarily important Robert Kennedy's words, spoken 50 years ago, still are in our world. So let's watch. There is another kind of violence, slower, but just as deadly destructive as the shot or the bomb in the night. This is the violence of institutions, indifference, inaction, and decay. This is the violence that afflicts the poor, that poisons relations between men, because their skin has different colors. For when you teach a man to hate and to fear his brother, when you teach that he is a lesser man because of his color, then you also learn to confront others, not as fellow citizens, but as enemies, to be met not with cooperation, but with conquest, to be subjugated, and to be mastered. This much is clear. Violence breeds violence. Repression breeds retaliation. And only a cleansing of our whole society can remove this sickness from our souls. We must admit the vanity of our false distinctions and learn to find our own advancement in search for the advancement of all. Boy, are we lucky to be together with you today, Carrie. And uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, the Oxford Union for <coughs> celebrating the 50th anniversary of Robert Kennedy speaking here. Uh, it's breathtaking always to listen to uh, Robert Kennedy's speeches. And I'm very 
not only incredibly moving, but as Kerry said, incredibly present because uh, the themes of how to find some peace in our society are the compelling issues that we face every day and that we continue to struggle with. And in a way, uh, in a very real way, we're, we're all here and the world continued because Robert Kennedy and John F. Kennedy understood how to make peace better than almost anybody else. And when a moment came 55 years ago in 1962 in the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the whole world could have ended, even the Oxford Union and all the rest, um, they knew how to find a way to have a peaceful resolution to a crisis that was bringing us to the brink of not only war, but potentially complete nuclear war and nuclear annihilation. And we're not past that yet, unfortunately. And we're really in the midst of another crisis right now. And it's why it's so important to remember the wisdom of Robert Kennedy and John F. Kennedy, and especially about this question of peace. And I want to follow Kerry by talking about uh, this period of time in global diplomacy, and especially the period of time of the Cuban Missile Crisis and just afterwards, because it, the two brothers and uh, President uh, Kennedy as uh, leader of this effort at the time did something miraculous that we need to understand what he accomplished and how he accomplished it and how unusual it was what he did and how we have to learn from it. And I uh, came to understand what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes by loving a speech of President Kennedy and it's the centerpiece of this effort to make peace in 1963 with the Soviet Union after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I fell in love with the speech because it's a speech unlike any other speech an American president has ever given, and I'll explain why. But then as I started to learn about the speech and study the speech, I came to understand, of course, more the context of the speech and it became an even more amazing story and a story that I find completely gripping and completely relevant and pressing for us now because it is a key to how you make peace when it seems impossible. And it also is a key to how to avoid stupid wars. And carry in my country, unfortunately, we have a bad habit of stupid wars. And Robert was fighting the Vietnam War in his presidential campaign because he saw how useless and mindless it was and that there was a way to peace. That's what he was proclaiming on his mission is running for president in 1968. And a few years before, together they had demonstrated the feasibility of this very, very different approach. So that's what I want to tell you about in a few minutes. So if we could um, start with President Kennedy's uh, inauguration, uh, where he said something that is, to my mind, the defining statement of, of our time. It is really the, the existential reality of uh, the modern period, unlike any other period of humanity. When President Kennedy said, the world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. That's an extraordinary fact of our time. It's still true, by the way, we could end poverty. <laughs> 
It would be a good idea. We've even pledged to do it. And we could end up destroying ourselves, of course, through war. But now we're so clever, we could even do it through wrecking the climate and the environment. And so this is part of our modern world, that we have a fundamental choice of solving fundamental problems or creating fundamental threats. Well, President Kennedy became president on January 20, 1961, and the administration started out with a, a disaster, actually. Uh, and uh, President Kennedy was part victim and part creator of the disaster. Uh, part victim because he was handed by the CIA uh, a, uh, a war to fight uh, at, uh, at the very beginning of the administration. This was the Bay of Pigs invasion, so-called the idea of a U.S.-led effort to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba. And this was like about 150 harebrained schemes of the CIA, which continue to this day, in my view, the most failed institution of American history. Uh, the president was more or less pressed this was something cooked up in the last years of the Eisenhower administration, and he was told, you have to do this. And of course, he asked the CIA, and they said, no problem, like they did about overthrowing Assad in Syria, like they do all the time in every disaster that they've cooked up for us in dozens of years of overthrowing governments in other countries. Well, President Kennedy, might have said no, though that would have been very, very hard, but he should have said no at the beginning of the administration. He didn't say no. He said, kind of, which was, uh, we'll do it, but no air cover uh, and no sign of uh, US, uh, U.S. presence around this. All right, this was not a good decision, by the way. Uh, and the CIA uh, launched this overthrow attempt with Cuban mercenaries, so-called, or Cubans that were trying to retake the country from Castro. They were all, it was all intercepted and they were all caught or killed on the beach of the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and uh, what ensued was, uh, if you uh, go to the next slide, was in exchange, one of the incredibly smart things, in fact, it was a world-saving thing that Kennedy had done, was to suggest to Nikita Khrushchev, his counterpart at the Soviet Union, that they have a secret correspondence, and that this correspondence would be seen only by the two leaders and their very closest advisors. And they kept that word, never leaking, about 130 letters that they sent to each other during the time of their uh, correspondence, which was from the beginning of President Kennedy's term. Indeed, a congratulation from Khrushchev to the end of President Kennedy's life in November 1963. They wrote to each other. In the US, only six or seven aides saw it, and Kennedy described who they would be and said, Otherwise, we will never use this for public relations or a leak, and neither side did. So they could talk to each other. Well, this was not, a, not, not the best day of uh, interchange, because uh, President Kennedy wrote to, Khrushchev wrote to Kennedy, I'm writing to alert you that a crime is being committed in your country's name. I'm sure you don't know about it, Mr. President, but there's an, in, an effort by part of the U.S. government to overthrow Castro. And uh, Kennedy wrote back, uh, I have previously stated and I repeat now that the United States intends no military intervention in Cuba. While refraining from military intervention, the people of the United States do not conceal their admiration for Cuban patriots who wish to see a democratic system. Well, this was an outright lie. Uh, this was not the finest moment. Uh, and uh, Khrushchev uh, wrote back, uh, you write the United States intends no military intervention, but numerous facts known to the whole world 
and to the government of the United States, of course, better than to anyone else speak differently. And Khrushchev goes on saying, never write to me like this again, uh, because this was really the Cold War, two major nuclear powers, one of them trying to overthrow a country violently, the president lying, as Eisenhower had done uh, just uh, the year before when uh, a spy plane was shot down and Khrushchev said, uh, the Russians said the spy plane's been shot down, but the CIA told Eisenhower, there's no way that they shot it down and if it's shot down, it's designed to disintegrate. And if by any chance the pilot were to survive, he takes the cyanide pill. So there's no chance that any of this is found. At which point Eisenhower denied the whole thing, at which point Khrushchev brought out the pilot to worldwide cameras who was fully alive and the whole plane had been captured. So this is a bad habit of the CIA getting presidents into trouble and presidents telling lies uh, on behalf of secret wars, which we should not be fighting. Well, the, the uh, point is that... Jeff, you, I thought you were here to talk about how great these guys are. I'm going to talk about... I'm gonna <laughs> when talk are we about, getting to that part? <laughs> it's very important to understand, uh, and, and in all seriousness, because this is the shaky start, and then the greatest diplomacy and statesmanship we have ever seen comes. So if you go to the next step, controversy, a heightening of the Cold War, mutual recrimination. President Kennedy came in absolutely to make peace, but within the first year, the tensions with the Soviet Union were exploding. And the Bay of Pigs was part of it. It wasn't the only part of it. There a, was a very deep, very real, very complex, and very much unsolved question about the state of Germany and nuclear weapons in Europe that was part of this heightened Cold War. And there had never been a peace treaty after World War II. So there were many issues that were unsolved. And, uh, this confrontation threatened the world. In the late summer, as Berlin became the center of potentially world nuclear war, the same way North Korea is today, the Soviet Union started to build, or East Germany and Soviet, under the Soviet decisions, started to build the Berlin Wall. And uh, you see that. Uh, going up. And soon afterwards, there was a showdown, which was another moment when we could have gone to uh, nuclear war, when tanks from both sides faced off, and they just stood there. And if one side had shot, it might have been the end of escalation. Finally, they were able to resolve it, and the tanks withdrew. But this was a standoff. Uh, 56 years ago, almost uh, to, to the day that we are here, uh, in which the world could have come to an end. Well, 1962 proved to be uh, uh, an absolutely terrifying year because Khrushchev said, okay, we'll teach the Americans a lesson. Uh, we're going to put nuclear weapons into Cuba secretly. Uh, we'll spring the fact uh, after the 1962 midterm elections. It'll be a fait accompli. And it'll teach them a lesson. First, they won't invade Cuba. And second, the US has nuclear weapons in Turkey, in Greece. That's what we have right on our border. We have American nuclear weapons. We'll teach them a lesson. Well, Khrushchev told this to his foreign minister, uh, Andrei Gromyko, and Gromyko was horrified and said, what are you talking about? We'll have, a, we'll have war. And Khrushchev said, no, no, this isn't about war. This is just to put, the, you know, put, put it back to them. This is just to teach them a lesson. And this is another illustration of craziness, how dangerous our world is, because Khrushchev absolutely did not mean war but we nearly ended up in complete disaster by this 
provocation. So as I hope you know, uh, the, the history, uh, the Soviet Union started to move in nuclear weapons into Cuba secretly, but the CIA did the, the thing the CIA actually does right sometimes, and that is that it collected information. You see, the CIA remembers two things. It's an intelligence agency, and it's a secret army. When it serves as a secret army, it's disaster beginning to end because there should not be secret armies and secret wars. But when it collects intelligence, that could be important. And it took photographs of the weapons being smuggled under tarpaulins on Russian Soviet ships and the missile sites being constructed. And this came to President Kennedy's attention in early October 1962, and it was the greatest crisis the world had ever known. What could be done? The Soviet Union had sworn repeatedly they would not militarize Cuba and that there would not be offensive weapons in. And this was discovered, and then it was denied, and the Soviet Union had completely lied uh, about this in the most direct way. And President Kennedy knew this was a crisis that could be the crisis that would be the, the end of all crises, and uh, gathered a committee around him, became called XCOM, to deliberate on what to do. And we have all the records, all the speeches, uh, because it was taped uh, for posterity. And what we know is that the generals mostly did what generals do, which is to say, we can take them out. We can shoot them down. They're not yet ready. We learned dozens of years afterwards the missiles were ready to fire. They were all set. If there had been any kind of attack, we would have had nuclear war. The generals had it wrong and the generals approached this from a military point of view. Two people said, no, we're going to find a way to bid for time. And that was JFK and RFK. And there were generals, uh, the head of the Air Force at the time, Curtis LeMay, who was essentially insubordinate and almost mutinous at the time, huffing that this is cowardice, that you're putting the whole country at risk, this is reckless, but they held the line to say, we will wait, we will see. And as you know the story, they opened up a secret negotiation uh, with uh, Khrushchev through uh, the uh, ambassador uh, in Washington, and Robert was the the liaison, and they established on the one side a quarantine that said no more ships can come into Cuba, demanded the withdrawal, and then secretly agreed with Russia that the U.S. would withdraw the missiles from Turkey and, uh, uh, and, uh, the U and Russia, the Soviet Union, would withdraw the missiles from Cuba. And this is how the crisis ended. All through these terrible days, which I can remember absolutely vividly because I was in second grade, and we looked up at the planes and said, are they coming to bomb us? Because that's what we understood. Uh, and uh, to this moment, I remember that because it was the most terrifying days, even if you were a second grader. Uh, I was uh, seven years old uh, at the time. Um, there were so many accidents, and President Kennedy said no more secret flights uh, because that could be a provocation, but of course another one went, and a famous line of President Kennedy is that there's always a son of a bitch that doesn't get the word, meaning that there's always the potential of an accident in this kind of event. One pilot went off course from an Alaska base and ended up flying uh, 
hundreds of kilometers over Soviet airspace in, uh, in uh, the Pacific region of the Soviet Union and did not provoke World War III, thank God. Well, at the end of this, and this is what brings me to the speech and to what I think is the most miraculous year of a presidential leadership and the most incredible statesmanship, President Kennedy, who had come into office determined to find a way to make peace, absolutely understanding, because he was very explicit and analytical about it, how accidents could lead to disaster. And one of his favorite books of the time was Barbara Tuckman's uh, book, uh, August uh, 1914, about the onset of uh, World War I and about how accidents had created this complete disaster. And then having found himself to have been part of this sequence of mistakes, misunderstandings, lies on both sides, escalation, and then to have come to the very edge of the very disaster that he was most committed to avoiding, launched a wondrous year determined to find a way back from the cliff. And uh, the strategy was to negotiate a test ban treaty with the Soviet Union. And the idea by itself was in a way outlandish because how in the very midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis could you have a treaty with the other side? It would be exactly the United States. Well, I won't even go into the analogies right now. I'll, I'll come back to them in a moment. Uh, because you can't imagine it quite with our current circumstance. But President Kennedy said, we need to find a way back. And he understood, and this was the genius of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the genius of this decision, he understood that Khrushchev must have been in the same situation as him, surrounded by generals saying, go to war, surrounded by advisors pushing the hard line, and he realized that his real bond was with Khrushchev, that there were two human beings trying to keep peace. And he intuited that Khrushchev did not want war and that he meant it when he said it, and that this was something that had gotten completely out of hand. And so in 1963, President Kennedy began an incredible campaign, unique in modern times, to, make, to find constructively a path to peace. And it's just what Kerry said. Peace doesn't just happen. It's not the absence of war. You have to fight against all the tendencies of hate, doubt, uh, what's called the uh, strategic dilemma, which is, oh, even if I want peace, they're going to attack first, so I have to attack first, leading to the mechanisms of escalation. And Kennedy said, we have to wind that back. And so, you can go on next. So another, a third individual in the world that I want to mention, because uh, he played a wonderful role in this, uh, Pope John Paul, uh, Pope uh, John the Twenty-Third, who was dying of cancer uh, in exactly those days, said that his last efforts on Earth would be to try to help create a, a space for peace to be found between uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And uh, interestingly, uh, Khrushchev took a great interest in the Pope uh, and in what the Pope uh, uh, wanted to say. And of course, President Kennedy it did as well. And a go-between, uh, Norman Cousins, uh, and leading editor of the day, carried the uh, Pope's message, Peace on Earth, Pacem in a great encyclical of 1963 in Russian translation to uh, Khrushchev that very moment, that day, and uh, one came to uh, President Kennedy in the White House. Kennedy was determined then to launch a public campaign, and he 
began it with uh, this speech uh, at American University, June 10, 1963. And when you go home and listen to Robert's speech in Minneapolis, listen to President Kennedy's speech in American University, June 10, 1963. You're going to get one more assignment also in a moment. This is the greatest foreign policy speech ever given by an American president. It's unbelievably wise and unbelievably beautiful and unbelievably unusual because what President Kennedy did in this speech was speak to the American people about how important it was for the American people to believe in the possibility of peace. He made no threats to the Soviet Union. He made no demands to the Soviet Union. He said, peace depends on our attitude because the message was on the other side, they want peace too. And it's an extraordinary idea because presidents like, I'll use a technical term, the idiot we have as president today, <laughs> who stood at the General Assembly and said, we will destroy your country to North Korea just a few weeks ago where Sonia and I were sitting almost there and hearing these shocking words. It's the opposite. What President Kennedy did was say, let us examine our own attitudes to peace. I want to read you a few excerpts of it. He said, I speak of peace because of the new face of war. Total war makes no sense in an age where great powers can maintain large and relatively invulnerable nuclear forces and refuse to surrender without resort to those forces. It makes no sense in an age where a single nuclear weapon contains almost 10 times the explosive force delivered by all the allied air forces in the Second World War. It makes no sense in an age when the deadly poisons produced by a nuclear exchange would be carried by wind and water and soil and seed to the far corners of the globe and to the generations yet unborn. He goes on, today the expenditures of billions of dollars every year on weapons acquired for the purpose of making sure we never need them is essential to the keeping of peace. But surely the acquisition of such idle stockpiles which can only destroy and never create, is not the only, much less the most efficient, means of assuring peace. I speak of peace, therefore, as the necessary, rational end of rational men. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war, and frequently the words of the pursuers fall on deaf ears, but we have no more urgent task. And this is I find incredible. Some say it is useless to speak of peace or world law or world disarmament and that it will be useless until the leaders of the Soviet Union adopt a more enlightened attitude. I hope they do. I believe we can help them to do it. But I also believe that we must re-examine our own attitudes as individuals and as a nation for our attitude is as, is as essential as theirs. And every graduate of this school, every thoughtful citizen who despairs of war and wishes to bring peace should begin by looking inward. Who talks like this? What president talks like this? By examining his own attitude towards the possibilities of peace, toward the Soviet Union, towards the course of the Cold War, and towards freedom and peace here at home. So let us persevere, peace need not be impracticable, impracticable, and war need not be inevitable. By defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. Now what he did then was go on to praise the Soviet Union, to praise the adversary to talk about the valor, to talk about the Soviet heroism in World War II, to talk about the Soviet contributions to the arts. Because his message was, it's human beings on the other side 
and they yearn for peace. So just to uh, read you quickly, no government or social system is so evil that its people must be considered as lacking in virtue. As Americans, we find communism profoundly repugnant as a negation of personal freedom and dignity, but we can still hail the Russian people for their many achievements in science and space and economic and industrial growth, in culture, in acts of courage. And then he goes on to talk about the uh, horrific sacrifice of the Soviet Union in World War II and defeating Hitler. You can go on. Well, Khrushchev was monitoring the speech. He heard it. It was the brilliance of President Kennedy in words of this scintillating inspiration and eloquence that uh, Khrushchev called immediately the American envoy in Moscow, Avril Harriman. And his words to Avril Harriman is, these are the finest words of an American president since Franklin Roosevelt. I want to make peace with this man. And that was uh, June uh, 11, 1963, the day after. And within seven weeks, the nuclear test ban treaty was signed. So by creating the underlying conditions of trust, by explaining how both sides can yearn for peace, by praising the other side, not attacking the other side, it was possible in a very short period of time indeed to tap into the humanity of the other side and the humanity of the leader and find this remarkable outcome. One of the things President Kennedy said, I don't think I have it in the, the PowerPoint, but it's very important for us now. In this speech, he said, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. Does that resonate today? Do you say little rocket man will destroy you? This is exactly the challenge we face today. Let me read it one more time. Nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. As President Kennedy said, such an approach is either a mark of bankruptcy of policy or a death wish. Please. Now, your third assignment. This was a busy time, and this greatest speech on peace was followed the next day by one of the greatest speeches on civil rights ever given, because this was uh, the height of the civil rights tensions, and this was a speech uh, in which Robert played a huge role. Uh, together, they said, we must speak to the nation, and Robert was pushing for uh, also that moral voice that was needed, that this wasn't uh, technical issues, this had to be explained. And President Kennedy gave the very next day, it was also a very busy two days for his speechwriter, Ted Sorensen, uh, gave a most wondrous speech and by the way, it was put together. These were such filled days that uh, the text wasn't, when the first text came back, uh, President Kennedy said, I want more. I want, this has to be put in uh, very uh, stark moral terms. So the speech ended up getting typed and delivered to the president's desk 10 seconds before the live national cameras went on. President Kennedy was a very cool character. And he sat there and he started the speech, which he had uh, never seen fully assembled and read through <laughs> until that moment. 
uh, and he made this uh, wonderful statement which reverberates till today in talking about uh, civil rights in America. He said, we are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. Well, one more, which you can listen to, but only three assignments. This one's optional. But it is a wonderful moment when President Kennedy spoke uh, in Berlin, because just after these two speeches, he took a European tour, which I don't have time to talk about the depths of it, but it was to prepare the way for the peace and prepare the way for the uh, partial nuclear test ban treaty. And he spoke to uh, famously in Berlin uh, and declared, uh, Ich bin ein Berliner, I'm a Berliner to a country uh, that was divided, that had created the most horrible crimes a generation earlier, but he was inspiring them to be a great new democratic nation. And it stuck because nobody in Germany ever forgets this speech and uh, the miracle of inspiration that it gave. Next. Then he went to the uh, Irish parliament on the way home, also visited the Irish homestead, it's another magnificent speech. Uh, the prime minister at the time of Ireland uh, was uh, de Valera, who had been born Irish in Brooklyn, uh, United States, actually, and had uh, then come back as a young boy to Ireland and become the Irish leader. And President Kennedy started out his speech in the Irish uh, dial, the Irish uh, parliament, by saying that uh, if my great-grandfather had not left uh, County Cork uh, when he did, uh, I might, if I were fortunate, be down there together with you in the Parliament. And if your Prime Minister had not left Brooklyn when he did, he might be up here as President. Uh, and, um, but then he went on to praise the role of Ireland as a peacemaker. Uh, but, oh, but he uh, said something which is also very important for us to always remember. Indeed, across the gulfs and barriers that now divide us, we must remember that there are no permanent enemies. Hostility today is a fact, but it is not a ruling law. The supreme reality of our time is our indivisibility as children of God and our common vulnerability on this planet extremely important because we have knee-jerk reactions. Iran is our enemy. Most Americans, I'll accept the ones in this room, probably couldn't name two cities in Iran, know nothing about Iran, but they know it's our deadly enemy. It's insanity. It's a kind of collective insanity. And what President Kennedy says is don't think like this. There are no permanent enemies. There are solutions if we find the rational pursuit of peace. Next. So he came back, and this was essentially the last campaign, the last campaign for peace and the last campaign in his life. Uh, and it was to take the case to the American people because a treaty had been signed at this point. He unveiled it in the most beautiful words always. He explained this is not the end of war, this is not the solution to everything, but it is a step. And he knew that right-wing opposition would denounce this and would say it's appeasement. It would say you're gullible, you're setting us up, you're selling us out all the things that are said always by the belligerents in politics. And so he was worried because in America you need a two-thirds vote of the Senate to ratify a treaty. And he knew that in America, of course, one of the most famous treaties, 
uh, the uh, Versailles Treaty had been rejected and America had never joined the League of Nations after World War I because uh, Wilson was not able to get that crucial treaty through the U.S. Senate. And Kennedy was not only at this point the soaring statesman, the greatest I think we've had in foreign affairs, certainly in since his time by far, but one of the greatest ever in our history. But he was all, also a, a ward politician who knew how to get votes and won all his elections and was going to win this one too. And so he went barnstorming around the country and he explained why this was in America's interest. And in the end, it was ratified 80 to 14. He had a decisive, complete victory in, uh, uh, in the US Senate and his popularity was soaring and his reelection in the next year was basically a foregone conclusion. Kennedy had grown to become one of our greatest presidents and one of our greatest statesmen in history and you watch that growth and the eloquence and the wisdom that had, uh, that had developed. It's, it's an unbelievable story. And his last great speech on, uh, on this was uh, September 20th, 1963, to the very chamber that I talked about. I'm a UN advisor. I sit in this chamber often and I always think about this speech because this is this President Kennedy speaking to world leaders. And he was the leader among the leaders. He had made peace. He had found the way to avert war. He had won the peace within America. He had negotiated the first decisive step away from the Cold War. He was determined to avoid war in Vietnam. He was determined to negotiate a non-proliferation treaty to follow the test ban treaty. And he came and he spoke to the world leaders as the leader among the leaders. And he said something I also find unbelievably beautiful. Just the beauty of it is so striking and how much it sticks with you. He tells them, two years ago I told this body that the United Nations had proposed and was willing to sign a limited test ban treaty. Today that treaty has been signed. It will not put an end to war. It will not remove basic conflicts. It will not secure freedom for all. But it can be a lever. And Archimedes, in explaining the principles of the lever, was said to have declared to his friends, give me a place to stand, give me a place where I can stand, and I shall move the world. My fellow inhabitants of this planet, let us take our stand here in this assembly of nations, and let us see if we, in our time, can move the world to a just and lasting peace. You can imagine the ovations, and you can listen to them that, uh, that, that come from this. So this is the story. Vision, eloquence, great politics, winning votes, getting the job done. And it's uh, two brothers who did that, and we've not seen anything like it since. Thank you. That was fantastic, thank you. Um, we have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Um, I think we should go straight into questions. Uh, so if you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high and wait until a microphone gets to you. Yeah, let's start with you on the front. Just wait for the microphone. Um, my question is for Miss Kennedy. As a profound admirer of your mother, I was really struck by the anecdote you told about her earlier. 
Um, what do you think her role um, was in your father's legacy? Um, that's very nice. So I'll tell her that that was the first question. <laughs> She'll love that. Um, you know, my mother uh, was is this incredibly joyful, fun, um, uh, energetic booster, and she is so she w she was not um, she was not involved at all in policy decisions. Um, or in any of that kind of the substance of what they were doing um, or the decisions that, uh, that Jack and Daddy were making or what was going on in the world, but she was creating a, an atmosphere that bolstered everything that they were doing and, um, and making it possible and making it fun to, to be part of their world. So. Um, uh, I think that was, that was her role, that's what she loved to do, and that's why God put her on this earth, and she did a, an, an amazing um, a job of it. If you, actually, there's a great book um, by, what's his name, somebody Clark, I can't remember, it's Thurston Clark, Thurston Clark, and it's called The Last Campaign, and it's about the 85 days of my father's presidential campaign, and it's just this wild, wild roller coaster ride of what was happening in that campaign. But there's a great description given to the atmosphere on the plane and the atmosphere on the bus and the trains that they took across the country and this kind of um, bonding between the candidate and the press and everybody sort of being together and um, having sharing birthdays and singing songs and making up lyrics to you know to old songs and really enjoying themselves and um, and several of the people who followed my father's last campaign asked that they be removed because they said as Richard Harwood one of them said. I've fallen in love with the candidate. I can't be. And I think that um, my mother played a really central role in creating that kind of atmosphere of, of joy and fun and adventure. And um, so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, let's go to, to you, just here. My, my question is for Professor Sachs. So I was just wondering how you deal with two uh, criticisms of Kennedy's foreign policy. One, that he is at least partially to blame for the Cuban Missile Crisis by driving Castro towards uh, Khrushchev. Uh, Castro only formally declared himself a Marxist after the Bay of Pigs invasion. And uh, secondly, you talked about uh, Vietnam. Kennedy actually was the first president to commit military advisors to Vietnam, which Johnson later escalated. And he also sanctioned the disastrous coup that ended in uh, Nodin Diem's uh, assassination and plunged uh, South Vietnam into turmoil for at least the next decade. So I'm just wondering how you reconcile yeah. uh, that bit. The United States, unfortunately, is, uh, is a war machine. Uh, and uh, It's like a, a, a vehicle that is uh, always in gear and always revving. And uh, you have to keep your foot on the brake all the time because there are so many uh, forces around that are pushing for expanded military reach. You know, the US has military positions in more than 170 countries on a, a, a recent count. We don't even know where they are, by the way, but in bases all over the world and people stationed all over the world. And this is the American security state that got completely out of hand that Eisenhower warned us about, the military industrial complex, and we're still there. So the Bay of Pigs was a provocation, not Kennedy demanding it, but a provocation from this machine that has viewed hostile governments or governments that are not seen to be America's friends as governments that are ripe for being overthrown. 
And this has happened all over the world. Uh, it has happened, of course, in the Middle East uh, repeatedly in recent years with uh, Saddam, with uh, Assad, with Gaddafi. It's a disaster. So Kennedy uh, took his foot semi off the brake uh, because uh, he was just coming in. He was assured uh, the military, uh, Eisenhower, this was all cooked. Uh, and um, that was, uh, um, I think, the, the explanation of it. Uh, Wait, it can, can I just clarify? Because you asked about the Cuban Missile Crisis, No, I'm, right? I'm going to come to but, that. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. No, sorry, was, yeah, okay. also to DM to, uh, okay. to the, okay, the coup in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, maybe I misunderstood uh, your question, but because I didn't hear all of it. But you asked also about the overthrow of uh, DM because that was another harebrained bad idea. Kennedy was pushed and pushed. We need to get rid of him. We need to get rid of him. Uh, and uh, uh, Cabot Lodge, who was the ambassador uh, in, uh, in Vietnam at the time that Kennedy didn't trust, was pushing back. We need to move. We need to remove this guy. And uh, again, this was a case where Kennedy was extremely reluctant. Uh, it was... Uh, he believed also that this was going to be peaceful. Diem was assassinated in the end. Uh, and when somebody walked in famously and whispered in his ear that Diem was dead, he put his hand over his mouth and rushed out of the Oval Office. He was aghast. He was horrified by it. Uh, and this was, again, this problem, you know, we talk now, it's the most common slogan uh, in, uh, in the newspapers, the adults in the room, because we have a president that obviously is not up for this, is unfit, has no attention span, and has uh, dangerous instincts. And so we talk about the adults in the room. Ah, who are the adults in the room? General this, general that, general that one? No, that's American history tells you they're not the adults in the room. Uh, if you don't have civilian adults in the room, we're in trouble. And we are in trouble right now. We should face it. We are in trouble because the American system pushes war. And it's very rare that you have leaders that are able to keep the foot on the brakes. Kennedy knew, and Robert knew, don't get into a land war in Asia. Kennedy had been in a war in Asia. They, I'm absolutely, I, you know, have, having studied this question, um, I think thoroughly, this particular one, I have no doubt Kennedy would never have gone the way that Johnson went. Uh, and that while there were advisors, he uh, had already told Senator Wayne Morris and others, where I'm getting out. But the American politics is tough and you're pushed and you're egged on and you're uh, accused of uh, being a, an appeaser and, uh, and, and not having guts and so forth. And uh, it takes a very unusual leadership to uh, face that down and that's what Kennedy learned to do. And so I think for me, the, my point of having started that way also is to show the unbelievable growth uh, because I believe Kennedy came in with the potential of greatness, but he achieved greatness in the third year. Uh, and the first year was mishaps. Uh, and, uh, but 1963 was, in, in his achievements in foreign policy, were of the ultimate and consummate statesmanship. And he was growing into the job of the most gifted statesman on the planet. Okay, can I? Could I respond as well? Could I add to that? You better. First of all, I agree with everything that Jeff says. Um, and I, uh, so I'm so happy to be here with you, Jeff, and to be having this discussion. But um, so Jack's, one of his best friends was a guy called Ben Bradley, who is the editor of the Washington Post. And he said to Ben Bradley, what I want on my grave was he kept the peace. And from his inaugural speech on to his entire presidency, 
if you just had to characterize it in one way, it was trying to stop war and trying to keep the peace, which he had a military industrial complex. And Jeff um, men mentioned Curtis LeMay, these crazies in the Pentagon who were urging him to nuclear war again and again and again at the confrontation at Checkpoint Charlie in Vietnam, at the Bay of Pigs, at the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, and those are just a few examples, but it went on and on and on. And he was trying all the time to pull it back, pull it back, pull it back. In the 1950s, um, Jack and Daddy and one of my aunts went to Vietnam. And, and then and they talked to Charles de Gaulle, who is a, a friend of my grandfather's. And um, they, they knew, Jack knew, there was no way that the United States w could win, should win, or should be involved in a war in Vietnam. And that's why, and all of his foreign policy advisors, all the entire Pentagon kept urging him, send troops, send troops, send troops, because there, um, China had fallen to the communists, and now Vietnam was going to fall to communists, and that was going to have the domino effect across Southeast Asia. So there was an enormous amount of pressure on him to send troops in, and he never did it. And when, when he, in, the, in November 1963, we had 16,000 advisors, not one troop in Vietnam. You know how many troops we had in Alabama? 20,000. We had 20,000 troops in Alabama. We had 16,000 advisors in Vietnam. And Jack had already written a memo demanding that we pull our troops out by January of 1963. 64. Uh, 64, sorry, thank you. 64, a thousand troops had already been brought out of Vietnam and brought home with the intention of bringing the rest. And then, of course, he died. And Johnson came in and sent 500,000 uh, young Americans to, to fight in that war. And was in 1968 was, um, General Westmoreland had asked for 250,000 more. And Johnson was about to send them. And then, you know, the whole campaign happened. But the, he, was, he was working really, really hard on, on peace. Great, thank you for that question and thank you for those answers. Um, yeah, let's go to you. Uh, yeah. um, thank you for coming to speak uh, to both of the speakers. I have a question for Ms. Kennedy. I'm a proud Indianapolis native and so we obviously have a very special place in our hearts um, for Robert F. Kennedy and his speech. Um, I run by the memorial um, every day when I go for my morning run. I was hoping you could comment on, history seems to be uh, very circular. Right now we seem to be experiencing a lot of the problems that both Kennedys were encountering, both in the foreign policy aspects of our American times right now and in our social um, domestic policy. I was wondering if either of you um, had any advice on what we could take from both Kennedys' legacies and apply to uh, practice in our world today, both at home and abroad. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, so I think that, uh, I, I think that, again, if you sort of look at Daddy's life, so much of it was about taming the savageness of man and making gentle the life of the world. It's sort of the bookends of, of what he did. And um, he, so you have to prosecute the bad guys. When bad things are happening, you have to hold people responsible. You have to go and look into it and be tough. And so we need to, um, we need to do that. We need to hold perpetrators responsible for injustice. On the other hand, we also have to understand the struggles that people people's lives are about every single day and, um, and approach them and approach our policies based on that idea that 
the, that every, every human being is a child of God, and the central force of government, the reason for government, is to protect dignity and maximize human freedom, and that we have to be driven to reach those goals by a sense of love and compassion. I think that that's, that sort of formulation really describes both what Uncle Jack's life was about and what Daddy's life is about. And it's really completely the opposite of what Donald Trump's life is about. And so I think that um, if you measure any particular policy against that, it, you sort of figure out what you should be doing. What do we do about refugees? Are we treating people with dignity? Are we prosecuting the bad guys, the, the, the people who are driving them to this? Are we treating the human beings with dignity? Are we motivated by love and compassion? Or are we doing something that's opposite of that? How do you deal with, with Syria? What should we be doing in that situation? What do you do when Ebola comes up? What do we do about health care for all Americans? So I think that that's, uh, I don't know if that, I mean, I could go into each detail of different policies, but I think overall, that's the framework I would approach it with. Maybe I, I would add a, a couple of uh, related thoughts. One of the uh, beautiful ways that they led uh, and that President Kennedy uh, exemplified in leadership is, uh, was one of those quotes uh, that uh, I uh, read, which said, uh, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. It's a kind of leadership style, which is define goals, explain where we could be, show how they can be achieved. And I think that this was one of the brilliant uh, ways and, and why we remember so vividly uh, the leadership because they were inspiring us constantly with goals and saying we should do this. And of course, one of the most famous ones uh, in May 1961 was, I believe this country should commit itself to uh, sending a man to the moon to before, and returning him uh, safely to Earth before the end of this decade. And that became an inspiration for, uh, for the moonshot and uh, a pretty cool way to spend your childhood uh, watching uh, all those rockets uh, go up uh, and uh, get to the moon before the end of the decade. So this kind of goal-based uh, idea, I think, is very powerful. And we don't use it very much in our politics, where politicians say, this is where I want to take us, and this is how it can be done. And that's essentially how Kennedy described the nuclear test ban treaty as well. The other point that I think is the, a common uh, understanding uh, and, a, and a common uh, part of the moral approach is this realization that when you have an adversary, they're also human beings and they also want the same things as you. It takes a lot of honesty and understanding and empathy to see through the other's eyes. This is crucial. If you have a confrontation, the key is first to understand the other side, not to demonize it, but to understand it and to try to find a way to reach a, a, a resolution. And I think that the, it's not just tactical, though tactics are also important that you understand the way that an adversary is seeing something, but it's also a moral idea because Kennedy, for example, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, had the gut feeling that Khrushchev was not trying for war, that he was a human being, that he was trying for the same thing, that the Russian people were not out for war. And uh, my favorite lines that I uh, did not read, I think it was <laughs> the, the last slide, which I uh, missed, but I want to uh, tell you uh, 
these lines because I think that they exemplify the moral approach that is uh, so important. In this diverse world, Kennedy says in this great speech, so let us not be blind to our differences, but let us direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. And for me, not only is that beautiful, but it's an essential moral basis for action, which is you're dealing with human beings on the other side. So find a way to make peace with them. Wow. I'm afraid I think that's all we have time for. Um, so please join me in thanking Carrie and Jessica. <laughs>